Today I'm joined by Patricia Heap. Patricia Heap-Boulet. Patricia is Triple Olympian, 1984, 1992 and 1996. WTA Tour player for 18 years. Most notable achievements, Junior Wimbledon Champion, 1983 in the doubles category. Uh, highest ranking in the world, number 28 in singles and 36 in doubles. And quarterfinal of the US Open as well as a WTA Tour title in singles and doubles. After her career, Patricia has moved into coaching and consulting to tennis players and tennis clubs. And Patricia has a performance academy and is a mental coach for tennis players. And we're going to talk about that later. And Patricia, to the best of my knowledge, your daughter and your son are Canadian tennis hopefuls. They are working on it. Um, Justin, my son, is 17. Uh, he won the national um, 18th in Canada last summer. He's been training um, on and off, but more now more on uh, full time in Halle in Germany with a, a team um, of great coaches at Breakpoint Base. Uh, he wanted, he wants to, you know, like all elite player, they want to go immediately to the tour. Um, don't think he really understands how hard it is. Um, however, we never say no. You know, we encourage him to, to dream big, to go after his dream. So if that's his dream, he's training at the right place. Um, our daughter has the same dream as well. Um, Isabel is 18. She, however, um, emotionally, uh, she's uh, a child, even though 18 years old is a child, but she's young emotionally. Uh, and, and that affects her mental strength, of course. So we suggested she go to a very good university, uh, which she is attending now for the first year. She plays uh, at Ohio State University. They have a, it's top. 10 quality they have a lot of girls coming out of there uh moving on to the the pro so she is definitely in good hands right now hmm. it's interesting because i'm also working with one of the tennis players uh remotely and he also went through the university system in the us and he's now a double uh, an atp tour player top 100 so it is possible it it, it used to be much more difficult um it's I believe during my time back in the 80s and even the 90s, going to university was seen as a failure because there weren't that many good coaches. Um, however, I've seen the trend changing. And of course, we're now talking about the rule changes <laughs> on the tour. Um, but since I, since about 2000, I saw the change in the quality of the coaches. There, if you find a, a college, there's only a handful still. Not all colleges in Division One is good, but there are quite a few that are really committed. The coaches are very committed in developing pro players. Okay, interesting. Cool, let's dive into the interview. Start with the first question, okay? Okay. In your life as an athlete, what was your darkest moment? Uh, 99%. <laughs> <laughs> no, I say that because, you know, I uh, there's only a handful where I could think of that, wow, I really performed the way I wanted to. So my darkest moment would be my third time when I fell off the ranking. Um, you know, I was, uh, when I was 15, 16. Yeah, 15, 16, 16. I was, uh, you know, I was in the junior Wimbledon. I won the junior Wimbledon doubles and I, w I was in the finalists in the junior, um, Wimbledon. So, and I was top 10, um, in the, I, um, ITF world, uh, ranking. And I was also 65 on the WTA. So the path was very clear that I was going to go, um, onto the pro tour. Um, I decided that I wanted to go to college. So I went to university. I went to University of Cal uh, Los Angeles and uh, went there for two years. And it, at the time, the, the system on the WTA required you to be actively participating in competing in nine tournaments. And because of the school load and the schedule, I couldn't, co I couldn't commit to that and my ranking fell off. So it was devastating. And I had to start from the beginning. And you can imagine, I mean, that's from 65 fell completely off. And I stopped from the beginning, got my ranking back. 
um, got an injury and then fell off again. And then when I came back again, I struggled for a few years um, to be in the 200. So when you've been in the top, in the top 100, a uh, top junior, and being in the 250 is simply not good enough. So that was my darkest moment, battling with injuries, battling with with um, the ranking and not getting high enough where I should be. I contemplated in quitting. Um, I believe at the time I was maybe 26, 25, around that time. Um, I needed to move on. Uh, and... Uh, I was very lucky, a very, my best friend on the tour, she was top 10 in the doubles on the WTA. And she said at that time, why don't you go and visit this coach and in Toronto? I was living in Vancouver at the time, Vancouver, British Columbia in Canada. And, uh, you know, the coach used to play for Canada and he's really nice and he's very knowledgeable. And um, I thought about it um, because you know, the time for an athlete to quit is when you wake up and you don't want to train anymore. You know, life is flat. You don't want to get out of bed. Things, it's just like the world is on top of you. Instead of the blanket, the world is on top of you. That's how heavy I felt. But I thought, you know, I don't want to live 10 years from down the road and going to regret that I didn't try. Mm -hmm. Because I was a personality, always one more, one more. And so I said, I have nothing to lose. I'm already at the bottom. I will give this one last shot. So I flew to Toronto and met up with a coach. And that was really my darkest moment for any athlete with the dream of turning or, or competing in the pro and doing good things, big things with the tennis, with big dreams. And when you feel like you're at the bottom of the barrel, that that's dark. What year was that? And um, eight. Let's see here, 89, okay. 88, 89. So yeah. That was even before you had your biggest successes. Right, right, okay. right. So, how did you recover from that moment? Um, now, looking back, because of course, we're always smarter <laughs> uh, with hindsight. <laughs> uh, looking back, the greatest uh, strength, courage I had was not to give up was really to give that one more try. Uh, and I believe that in, in life itself, in an athlete, if you are facing hard time and you're just in the middle, you have not have enough pain to move you forward because you're still halfway looking at that glory and then halfway your feet are dangling in the air. I don't know what to do. So you're in a guessing game. But if you completely sink to the bottom, you're going to do one of two things. You're going to either do something very different and then you're going to rise. You have no other place to go but to give the entire 100% with no questions asked. And you will just let fate take itself because of your effort. Or the other way, the second way is you don't do anything at all. And then you just continue. So I chose to do something about it. Um, I met up with, with um, the coach, uh, Simon Batram, his name was is and um, he was very kind I think he he was not judgmental with my career and that was important um, I was very judgmental on me I was very hard on me perfectionist all the way um, and he was very understanding it was baby step he baby step he took the band-aid if you if you can use that analogy he used the he lifted the band-aid little by little to reveal my wound, which was my emotions. I was very hurt and, you know, confidence wise and everything was down. And he lifted that little and I trusted him. Mm. So the combination of, of not wanting to regret having the guts to do it one more time and trusting, those were the two combinations that got me out of my, my, my hole. Mm. And out of personal interest or something that just popped out in my head. You had a bit of a difficult childhood in the sense of you had to fl you had to escape from Cambodia because of civil war, right? Exactly. It was the Khmer Rouge, yes. And what just popped up, you said you were always been a fighter. I mean, having had these experiences, does it maybe making playing tennis much easier and coming back from injuries? Because, I mean, if, if, if you weigh the importance, I would think life-threatening situations and escaping, once you've mastered that, Coming back from an injury seems to be fairly easy. Um, 
a lot of people had told me that um, that they they think it was uh, something like that. There were articles that WTA wrote, you know, calling me the survivor. You know, that, that may be, you know, be, but I was only I was only six and a half years old, right? Uh, back then with the Khmer Rouge, you know, the Civil War. Um, and 40 some years later, after that, 50, you know, I, I still remember that feeling. So when you are put in a situation, especially at a young age, it, it resides, it stays with you. And you will all, you can always reach that point. I believe you may not remember it um, in your mind, but in your gut, you remember it for the rest of your life. It, when I always feel like when I'm, I'm triggered, when I'm put against very hard situations, it, it's it's a, like a punch in my gut, and then that gut actually triggers it and it comes out, and it has happened several times in in on um on the tour in my own life where I must believe that has something to do the connections. It's not so much the memory; it is the the feeling that I associate it with it that I can I can depend on. What was your best moment? Um. This is going to sound really, really strange. My best moment was when I lost to Mary Jo Fernandez at the Olympics in Barcelona in 92. Uh, I had 10 match points mm. and I lost the match. And why I say was that best moment, because it was exactly, exactly that moment after I lost that I was so upset beyond words. Nobody, nobody could consult me. Nobody could tell me how hard I tried. I didn't care. And I went into such a rage inside. It kicked me into 10 different gears. And because of that moment, I had my best year. I went into US Open after that got to the quarters. Uh, before then, I, you know, before then was Rogers Cup. It was called differently at the time. Forgot what it was called now. It was called differently in Canada. And I got to the quarters and on and on and on. It was at that moment where nobody cherished pain. <laughs> nobody just say, oh, I love this struggle. And, you know, looking back, that was the best moment that got kicked me into different gears. Okay, that's interesting. I've spoken to Alex Korecha recently and I asked him about that match against Sampras. He had match points. Sampras was vomiting on court and I actually thought it was a bad moment for him because, you know, opponent not fully fit and he still loses. But he said that was his best moment because he also he realized he can be a good player beating or almost beating Sampras at the US Open. So uh, interesting. If you could go back in time, what advice would you give your younger you? My younger you is to appreciate, um, appreciate. I, I was always a hard worker. You know, um, I know everybody, everybody said, oh, you got to work hard. But I, I, there was no doubt. Um, my, my fitness coach and my coach always had to pull me back. I was one of those. I would just keep going. And they, they had to pull me back to rest, to rest, to rest. Um, you know, my younger self, I would say, to appreciate um, the Olympics, to appreciate the team events. Um, when you're on the tour, it's all about you. It's really all about you. You know, I mean, and myself. Um, I wasn't. I wasn't a selfish person. I was self-centered. I was very narrow focused in what I needed to do. Um, had I, I, I would tell myself to enjoy at the Olympics, for example. Who does not want to go to the Olympics, right? And they go watch other sports. I was so focused in my sports that I didn't even go watch other sports, you know, which was a shame because there were amazing athletes there. Now I watch it on TV, right? I had a life there and I didn't watch. Um, that would be it. And um, Fed Cup, uh, you know, a team, I played for Hong Kong and in Canada. So I played a lot of Fed Cups. I did not enjoy um, the team perspective. Because I had my own way. I was very stubborn. It was my way. I, I would go to Fed Cup and um, 
I wake up the night be- the early than everyone. I on an index card, I would write out what I want to train that day, and at breakfast time, I would give that to the captain. This is it's like a menu, my menu, right? It was so now looking back, yeah, it was good, but that also prevented me from just relax and enjoy the team. It's it's a different it's a different atmosphere. Even when I was at the university. I didn't. I enjoyed being there as a player, as a student. I did not enjoy the team. So that was one thing I would have changed. We spoke about that a little bit. What are the habits that make you a successful person? A successful person. I was always because of the situation I was put in at six and a half years old. Uh, I saw life and death. Right. You learn that the world is full of struggles and challenges. It's not about roses. Um, where that differ me, that made me different than my peers. Come, you know. And if you think about it, Hong Kong, when I, I lived in Hong Kong for 17 years. Now people know what Hong Kong is. When I was coming up from tennis in Hong Kong, it's just a speck on the, on, on the, uh, on the map. And when I used to play tournaments, people said, where's Hong Kong? Do you live on the boat? Do you wash your clothes in the, in the you know? And I'm like, oh my gosh, people don't know. Um, so, you know, I, I embraced, I was able to embrace the challenges of life and rise above it. That was a confidence in myself as a self-esteem from a very young age because purely because of the, of the situation I was put in. Do you have a morning routine as an athlete or nowadays as a coach? How do you get ready for the day? For the, the morning routine was um, nothing major. I, when I was competing, I always liked to be isolated. Um, I knew myself that I could not switch on and off. I was either an off switch or an on switch, meaning if I was off, I couldn't focus. I had to focus really from the moment I wake up. I, I, you know, I wake up, I go breakfast, you know, go to the court. I always like to go to the court maybe two hours before because I like to take my time. And, and you know, uh, I take my time forever from going to the locker room. For I was very diligent with my pre warm up and my post stretching. Very diligent, not just tournaments but also in training. If I was training twice a day, I would do my pre warm up twice and my post stretching twice. Mm. So uh, that was my profession. That was my routine. And then talking about training or matches, how did you prepare for important moments? Um, every match uh, you know, was important to me. Every match was important to me uh, in the sense of, You know, when you grew up in Hong Kong, people didn't really respect you at the time internationally just because you're, you're nobody. You're nobody. When you were from uh, Japan, there was a, a big uh, group. Uh, when you're playing from Euro Europeans, there's a big group or Americans. But Hong Kong, I mean, who, who's from Hong Kong, right? So, you know, I, so for me, I when I played my first international tournament when I was 13 on to even the pros, I had this this feeling that I always had to prove myself, you know. So therefore, every match became important, which would not be something I've prescribed <laughs> to people. But again, you know, uh, every time I came back from a tournament, especially if I did well, you know, it was a lot of pressure on the on the from the country in Hong Kong, where if you're the only one and they want to really escalate your exposure, so. Every match became important to me. Okay. And then there's a question I have out of personal interest. You played Monica Selesh and you played Steffi Graf at the height of their careers. Who was the tougher opponent? Uh, I've always been able to go three sets with Steffi um, because we played similar game style. Um, Monica was tough. I remember the first time I played Monica um, in California, I think, and I thought I was going to die on the court. I was pretty fit. Yeah, you know, my nickname on the tour was Speedy He, so I was quick. I, I earned myself from my uh, a nickname from my peers. Uh, the first time I played Monica, we went three sets. I thought I was going to be Pete Sampras puking on the side of the court. 
it was playing, it was sprinting uphill the whole way. And after that match, I thought to myself, I will never again lose a match because I was not fit. Yeah. So Steffi, um, uh, Monica was definitely the toughest one for me. Uh, and Steffi was tough as well, just because you, know, you can't get past her. You know, she was lethal. But yeah. Monica, but Monica mentally, Mon Monica mentally was a wall. You cannot puncture her. She was dangerous as uh, when she was ahead. And she was tough as nails when she was behind. Mm. <laughs> so that's that's tough. Yeah. And I think also the way she played, she could open up the court a bit more, right? And you being small, you had to probably cover more distances as opposed to Steffi Graf. Um, Steffi gave me more errors. Steffi, I, I, Steffi gave me more errors where, where Monica, she was constantly putting pressure on you. Mm. That it was the pressure I felt more than anything. Because if you hit anything less than perfect ball, <laughs> um, she, she could be all over you. Mm. She didn't give me any breathing room. How do you overcome setbacks? Overcoming setbacks, you need a team, a team around you. It It, it is uh, every day is a grind. Every week is a grind. Uh, when you travel, uh, when you travel 30 weeks, <laughs> it's a grind. So even I was very, I was very, very fortunate. Um, when I started playing tennis, my dad was my coach. So he either he traveled with me or my mom traveled with me. And later I had a coach traveled with me as well. Uh, so I always had a team to help me through the, the mental tough times. And it def, it's very unusual to have friends on the tour because it's so kind, it's very cutthroat, right? It, it's a lot of pressure out there. I was very fortunate. I had, I had one best friend on the tour with me and I had, three really good friends we would train together we would not completely you know let go but we could help each other bounce back a little bit hey you know what keep trying keep working it's going to be or the coaches at the time the, there was more of a camaraderie with other among other coaches you don't find that now but the coaches you know they will hook up with each other hey let's tomorrow let's let's you know go on the court together and train together so there was so we had a team a mini team on the tour we help each other out quite a bit you're doing mental coaching now so is that something you developed because of that experience or is that something you developed after when i uh, was when i started showing some talent uh, my dad recognized that hey maybe you know she has a chance i was small um i would i i wasn't fully grown but even when i was fully grown you could see that i was only going to be five three um the girls pam shriver <laughs> Yeah, you know, uh, yeah, they they all over six foot. Most of them average out at five ten, five eleven at the time. So I was taught before I even started playing tennis. Uh, my dad and I would watch matches um, on TV before I play, and he would educate me. Oh, you know, this is a bad shot. That was a good shot. And then he would he played competed himself, so he would predict. He would literally predict where the next point, at least from the serve, the next two hits from there. So I, in the beginning, when you're seven years old, you're like, wow, he, he how did he know that? And as I got a little older, I said, you know what, I'm going to try to outrun him. I, I'm going to try to outthink him. So I would beat him to the prediction. So from a very young, young age, mentally, I, he, I was on that. I don't think he did it on purpose to, to mentor train me. me. When I started playing again and I showed the promise, I was about uh, 10 years old. And he, my dad said to me, all right, you want to beat these girls? Two things have happened. You have to outrun them and you have to outthink them. And that's how I was trained all the time. When I started playing internationally, that's my trait. I outrun people and I outthink on the court. In time, that, that brain of mine, you know, the, the neuroplasticity, got expanded and the struggles that I went through in my own childhood got strength, got strength in there. And, um, and I always believed that was my strength that after I retired, I went into, you know, different things. Every time I coach players, more than half the time, I'm speaking to the mental on the mental part. So a year and a half ago, I was uh, in charge of the elite program in this at this club in Toronto. I decided that I want to reach a larger audience. 
I wanted to help parents as well, the pathway for parents. So I um, stepped away from that coaching job and went into mental training with uh, players now and, and also helping the, the parents of those players with the pathway. Do you have a role model? I have several role models. Um, Billie Jean King, definitely one of them. I I had the fortune of uh, playing team tennis uh, uh, and Billie Jean was the assigned coach to my team. Uh, and she introduced what going after your dreams are like. You know, there was nothing, that's what I got the message, there is nothing you dream that you cannot reach. And that's very parallel to how I was brought up. And my second role model is Nick Boletari. And I was under Boletari for three years from the age of 15 to the before I turned 18. And Nick was the motivator, right? I, and when we went to tournaments, there was a few of us when we come back, we're expected to come back with a win. <laughs> not, not second place, first place. So this one time I came back and I lost in the finals and he called me Patty. Hey, Patty, how'd it go? Yeah. Oh, I lost in the finals. What? You lost? You know, it was like, you know, the, the, the worst thing. Yeah. Well, what happened? Well, I, I lost my forehand because that was a trait for Bill Terry. So it was the forehand, right? And I said, I lost my forehand. And he goes, what do you mean you lost your forehand? And then he, you know, he made go, oh, let's go, you know. So we, I ran after him to go on the court and we do this. He's barking at me from the side, you know, 10 minutes. And my forehand, of course, was superb. <laughs> and he looked at me, he's like, well, what now? And then I look, I'm okay, no. I'm fine. I'm fine. So he brought on me that motivation. Uh, he, he was able to motivate players to do great things. Um, you know, those two. And then one more was my dad. You know, my dad was a hard worker. My dad was about work. And he just believed that work and life will give you according to the work you put in. No, oh, that's interesting. Okay. Yeah. So what's the best advice you received and who gave it to you? My best advice... Um, My best advice, and, oh, there was this, I forgot his name. He is actually from Sweden. Um, oh, I forgot his name. He was great. And we never, we never spoke. I played his player at the time a few times. Um, and, but it wasn't somebody I, but he kept an eye on me. So when I was on my second time, third time, you know, that downtime, I was miserable and I finally, you know, I think, I guess I must have qualified and then one of the grand slams, I was sitting in the, in the player's lounge and by myself, he walks over to me. He said, Patricia, what happened to you? And I was, I was stunned because I didn't even know the player was top 10 player, by the way. Right. So you can imagine I'm hanging out in 250. I was stunned that, that he even noticed me. He, then he said, you know, you were this, 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 and this, and you were with this, this, and this. He knew how the, how I played and how I walked, how I behaved when I was at my best. So he brought back to me, he said, you know, it's, you had it. You had the eye of the tiger when you play. And I was like, For somebody to notice that, I was like, wow. So that really just shocked me out of my shock. <laughs> okay, on your website or your blog, you have a lot of valuable information about fostering relationships between parents and children, how to teach and coach tennis children. Is that Where does that motivation come from to talk about more about the approach of how to develop younger athletes rather than the top athletes? That came out from after I retired in um, 98, 99. Eight, we started our own academy, my husband and I, in uh, Hilton, South Carolina. And we worked with a lot of, we, we first worked with trans transition players into the tour. Then we decided when we had our children to work with younger players. So we are, I would say, out of the... 20 years of experience of meeting multitude of parents and of course coaches all over the world, I came to the conclusion, and I'm not the first one, that there has been a lot of uh, misconnects between parents and coaches. You always hear about the coaches, you know, complaining about the parents, and then you hear the parents complaining about the coaches and go back and forth, and the ones that suffer are the kids. Um, 
children have a special place in my heart. I love children from even babies. I don't know why, but I do. Yeah, I, I love children. Uh, they are the future of tomorrow, right? And they are like sponges where we can help them to be great leaders or we can destroy them. So when we had this, and I, I have always been mentally really strong, and I noticed that with children, they are sponges. I could help them shape a mind of an elite, doesn't matter what, just of an elite. So they can be, you know, leaders of and make a difference in the world. And I love talking to parents and parents, I notice gravitate towards me. They trust me. And because um, I, what you see is what you get. I don't have, I don't sugarcoat. I don't hide anything. I don't have an agenda. And I will tell parents straight out what my thoughts are. Some like it, but most people like, some don't like it, but most people like it. And I'm cool with that. And I understand that I'm not going to please everyone. But I didn't get to a top player, to that that place, that position as a world-class player Olympian without having a thought of my own and my own belief. And I can share that. And that's a pretty solid belief I have. So in the blog, before prior to having my blog, I wanted to help bridge the gap between the parents and the coaches and help the um, the to give a better pathway to the children. That was my thought. I looked and researched and most of the information out there are either from people who's never competed. It's easy for somebody, even coaches, if they have not played, they really don't understand what's going on inside an athlete. Only the athlete will understand what's going on, right? From, and because I was uh, an elite coach, I coach for many years of elite players and I'm a parent coach of two players who have a pretty good level of play. Um, I was also a business person, right? And I'm a parent coach, right? So I feel like I have all the dimension in helping all from different sides. And that's why I started this blog. Let me put something in there. I want to be different. I wanted something to be read in 30 minutes. That, uh, sorry, sorry, minutes, 30 seconds. A blog that somebody can read in 30, I want to keep it simple, read it in 30 seconds. I want a fourth grader. A fourth grader can read it and they understand as well. Now, we all think like, oh, you know, you got to put hard words in there, make it complex. No, no, no. It's actually harder to make it simple. And that was my thought from my own experience, how, telling parents, okay, how do you get the most out of coaches? You know, or what are the things you do actually don't even get attention from the coach because that happens, right? So I want to be as accurate as I can from my own experiences and put it on the blog and to be refreshing. Mm -hmm. Interesting. <laughs> and I also saw that um, you're using the MBTI uh, action typing 16 personalities. Um, out of personal interest, at what age of the child do you think that is accurate? <laughs> Uh, when when they uh, 10 years old, okay. you know, depending on the age, right? Um, 10 years old, and of course, the, you know, some of the questions in there are a little hard, so I'll have the parents do it with them a, a, as well. Um, and then when they get to about 14, then they, I let them go and do it on their own. It's fascinating. I love 16personalities.com from a coach's standpoint because that that gives me an idea how, how I can tap into their brain, you know, mm -hmm. because that's what mental coaching is. You want to get into somebody's head. Mm -hmm. um, and also when I used to travel with a, a few players, I was traveling with seven players one time to El Salvador. I had all seven of them, you know, because and it, we went for two weeks. I can tell you because of that program, it was the best trip. It was myself alone. I went with seven teenagers. And you know teenagers are not easy. Um, and I use that quite a bit into my coaching. Back in the days, how did a typical training day look like? You just have to, just a rough outline. How, how often did you train per day? Um, different phases of my life. When I was uh, between, I started when I was eight. So between eight and 15. Uh, my typical day, I woke up uh, at uh, seven o'clock. I uh, went to school until 3.30 every day. Um, had a break for half an hour and my co I was only on court one hour, hmm. four to five. And uh, with my dad, it was private lesson every day. 
uh, five, six days, uh, six days a week. And uh, Sunday, that was my day off. And then for fitness, I hardly did anything. It was just a little jog around the little soccer field. And uh, it was a very small soccer field. Um, and then when I went to Boletary when I was 15, and uh, it was school, uh, Monday to Friday, school from in the morning. And then tennis was uh, three hours in the afternoon, followed by an hour of sprinting on the court by five miles of running. So you can imagine when I first got there, it was very <laughs> difficult. So the first day I did all that. So I had to stop. They have a, when we go for a long run, the co one coach in front, one coach at the back. And of course, needless to say, I was at the very back and I had to stop because I was vomiting. Um, and the coach stopped with me. and. Um, while I was vomiting, I was thinking to myself, oh, good, I could just walk back, you know? And when I was done my, doing my thing, the coach said, okay, let's go. And I had to keep, keep jogging back to, to the place. Um, so that was uh, Monday to Friday was like that. And then on, on the weekend, um, when Nick was in town and not on the tour, and he, we would go off to a private place to train some more. Uh, Saturday would be full day. And Sunday um, was a treat. We would go train on the beach uh, fitness. And then after we hit at his house, the treat was we had a buffet. <laughs> that was our treat. So sometimes we I train seven days. Um, so that was my routine. Okay, cool. And um, do you want to nominate someone to be interviewed? I would love to nominate Natalie Taziat mm. from France. Um, Natalie was number, yeah, yeah, yeah. She, cool. She's number three. Uh, she's number three in the world. Um, the reason I nominate Natalie is because Natalie didn't hit hard. Natalie was so smart on the court. Um, she definitely utilized everything she had to reach there. It was quite amazing. Um, she is now in Japan with a player, with a Canadian player, um, whom I am actually going to join with on Tuesday. So I will tell Natalie to expect an email from you. Oh, that's great. Cool. <laughs> okay. Where can people find you? Uh, they can find me through my email, hytennis, that's T-E-N-N-I-S, um, at gmail.com. I'll go to my blog, uh, Patricia, H-Y, dot com. Okay. And the mental coaching that you're offering, who's eligible to that? Uh, athletes. Um, I have turned down quite a few people <laughs> from, you know, because, they, you know, when you go to spaces, um, I want to focus on athletes, um, specifically tennis players, because of my tennis background. Um, I... I would love to, right now, I, I started this year, so I am only taking 15 um, players. Uh, I only have four spots to go. <laughs> so that that's going to, I think my, my goal um, is going to be, and the reason I want to do it slow, because I really want, I bring the tennis aspect into it. Um, I'm unique as a person. I'm unique with everything I do. I, um, and not, I don't do, uh, you know, nine to five. For me, it's never a clocking. It's by project. It's always what the player needs, what the player needs. You know, like I'm working with this 12-year-old who's at the Nationals right here, and she's never had a coach before. So I said, uh, you know, I, I want you to do the, this, this. And the, the, I got this text back from parents like, oh, my gosh, this is so cool. You know, like so her daughter's never had a coach during the tournament. You know, so that's what I do. I go outside the norm and I would like um, to 2020 to put more to another layer of more of the pro players on there. Right now, I'm doing national players. Next year, I will put some more. Um, I'm crafting my days. I'm not looking to fulfill me every week to, 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 uh, to go to work or every, every day, 10 hours work. I'm crafting my day. I'm crafting my life so that I have the a, a excellent experience from the lesson I learned in my youth, that I never enjoyed the time because I was just doing. Now I'm crafting my day so I can enjoy everything else. Oh, that's great. Patricia, thanks so much for your time. I hope we can do a follow-up on that. I really, I'm also into this um, long-term athlete development outline. And um, I've done, it's actually a fun fact. I did six, seven years ago, 
I did a consultancy to the Hong Kong Tennis Association for their long-term athlete development outline for the tennis players. That was really cool. Wow, that is cool. You've just been everywhere. Congratulations yeah. on that. And thank you so much for having me. I thank you for your time and we catch up again. Okay, take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.